hello, I am Jo Hickey Hall and this is the Modern Fairy Sightings Project and I'm really delighted to welcome Paolo Samut. So you are a, a paranormalist and a magician, so tell us about yourself. Okay, yeah, I mean it's more as a ghost hunter than a fairy hunter, but everything tends to blend into one and my approach is very much exploring the, the supernatural, exploring the paranormal and um, really focusing on experiences. I think that's as far as we can go nowadays. Um, I, I don't think physics can explain some of the things people experience. And so I've not really focused on that angle, but more what can I experience? And that's really what gives us the best gift with the paranormal. When we look at this, we have experiences, we see the world, we see some of the, the beings in our world we share it with, and that gives us much more. You know, we, we meet a ghost you're going to be more likely to believe in, say, life after death. That's a very sort of strengthening position to be in. So looking at all these things, seeing a big world, looking at how everything interacts, how everything wants to sort of speak to us and we open our minds a little bit, open our eyes a little bit, it becomes very interesting. Yeah. So I started off really looking at ghosts and then it's got me going into, into woodlands quite a lot more. And then, you know, the beings we encounter there are not often ghosts, they're more, they're more like people, or fairies, it's maybe not the right word, wooden spirits, um, elementals, I don't know what the word is really, but certainly they're beings we can interact with and have experiences with, which, um, you know, enrich our world. And, you know, on top of that, it's been learning about magic over the last like 30 years and the techniques of meditation, visualization, and so on, which helps to communicate. Um, there's still so much to learn, there'll always be so much to learn. But, you know, step by step, going through that, working it all out, and um, saying hello to the beings in our world. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, how did you get into all of this? What, was, what sparked your interest initially? You know, as, as I don't know whether you were a child or older. Always been interested, and I think a lot of it is, um, I don't know whether I count as psychic. I've had enough psychic experiences, we'll talk about that in a bit. But, you know, growing up, there's always been things around me. And um, living in a house, you know, my, my parents moved to a house I'm in, in 1979, so I was about eight or nine. And there was enough spooky stuff there, which really just got me interested in books. And I thought, what was that? What's going on? And from there, it's like, I've just never put it down. I've just been, been thinking, you know, what is all this about? What, what was going on? And I'm um, trying to learn more about it. Mm. That's quite interesting that you mentioned nine. Um, I've been speaking to um, Ed, oh my goodness, what's his surname? Um, another, a fellow researcher. And um, he was mentioning to me about that because the um, episode was released last night about the little girl who had the experience with talking to a tree and um, and some other fairy fairy beings that were present and um, he we, we talked about the number nine in that episode and he was talking about the number nine and how a lot of um, encounters happen around that age so it's interesting that you're mentioning that as well, because I think it is a time. It is quite a sort of it's probably interesting something. age. Because you know, people talk about puberty and stuff, and this is you know, earlier than that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think there's probably different stages in life, which are maybe sort of le less meaningful in sort of a, a biological sense. But in terms of us establishing our identity, becoming beings, yeah, becoming sort of, you know, conscious people who look at things, look at the world, decide what we like, whether it's ghosts or racing cars. It's maybe the age where we start to establish ourselves. So maybe there's something like that there. Yeah. And I mean, I guess with with nine, it is a threshold, isn't it? Before you get to, you know, double figures. Well, nine is always about transformation. Number of the moon as well. It's visionary states. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. So there's something in that. I'll have to think about that. So you mentioned um, the woods. Was that something that sort of developed? So, I mean, a lot of people go for walks in the woods. I mean, you know, you'll get families going for walks, you'll get runners, you'll get people using the woods for all sorts of different, in all sorts of different ways. And I think, I don't know about you, but, you know, the woods in the daytime, as opposed to the woods that's sort of twilight and darkness, it's a very different space. Mm. So what, how did your relationship develop there? 
it's um yeah it, it's something which grows and it's something i mean i'm i've lived where i'm living for like you know 12 years now i'm moving away soon and a couple of years ago um i was walking through these woods where we you know my house there's a garden and then there's a short, a short stretch of green and then there's a river and then around that you've literally got the m5 motorway just whizzing by 200 meters away it's nothing you know um and you know we go out for walks somewhere and something something again it's one of the interesting things to say perhaps is mm. sometimes you're picking up on things you're not even aware of until somebody else points them out and um about a couple of years ago i was walking through there with a friend of mine and she pointed out something really pokey here isn't there? you know i'm embarrassed i missed this but you know it's um you, you realize then that yes actually there is something really pokey here and um the first step then was we actually just walked through the wood, a bit of a meditation, say hello. And we're saying hello to the trees, you're saying hello. There's, there's two crossroads just by it. And we, we walked down this path and it runs parallel to the M5. And um, just by where you come past my house, and I'm being very coy not to give my address away and so on, um, you get to the river, you get to this four way crossroad with a very strong mal tree, um, and it's very tall, it's an Acer. Um, mm. And then you go around a little bit, and then there's two small slender trees which are very female. There's a three way crossroad there. And you can feel different energies on there. Now, it's one of those things where I get very, subject, I get very sort of you know, subconscious about because a lot of this stuff is not necessarily visual. It, it, it's sense, it's feeling, it's almost meditative how you're in a space and you see things or aware of things. Yeah. And then you walk all the way down to the motorway, and there's like another, just where the pathway ends, and you've got to the, the, the M5. There's like another crossroads, and it's a very sort of, almost like a darker space. Um, mm. Again, hard, hard to say, all very subjective. Yeah. Um, and it feels like things are rolling off the motorway and being caught and trapped in this little area. Um, to the point where a friend of my, a friend of mine and myself, we did a road open ritual on the, on the motorway a few months ago. And I just left the road open the powder, just said a few prayers, a few blessings, and just opened up the pathway so anything trapped there can move if it wants to. Mm. It's, it's changed its feeling over the last couple of months to the point yeah. where there's no litter there. All these things are just clearing up a little bit. So it's quite nice and weird. It's doing that. And you walk back and you've got the, the sense of the other trees, the other places. Now, what happened is the time when my, my friend you know, pointed out, oh, there's something here, and we sort of went back. We actually went back to my place and we, we did a ritual that evening, which was um, Crowley's headless ritual, hornless ritual. And there's various versions of that floating around the internet. And at the end of that, it's like we lit up the space around us and um, the, the woodland spirits, whatever you want to call them, they literally walked up from that bit of the forest with a garden and they never entered the house, but there was, you could feel them standing outside the back door, literally just greeting in. I mean, it was a July evening, the door was open, there's cats coming in and out and stuff, and what trap them in. And you could just feel that change in presence. Um, you know, I, I know if you're a skeptic, this doesn't sound very good, but you know, it's literally what happened there. Yeah, you've got you know, to go it, with it. Yeah. yeah. You trust, with, yeah, sorry, carry on. And, and running with it, you feel it. I mean, you know, the offerings you can make, I, I, I leave them cake, but I, I went through, I picked up all the litter in that area, and slowly that space, it's, it's like it's regreening really itself as I'm doing that. You know, the pick-up litter was a one-off thing, which I've done, I still pick up a bit of a walking through it. But since then, there's less litter being dropped, there's less cyclists running through at breakneck speed, there's oh, yeah. less drug dealers on the, on the, on the periphery of it and so on. So it's slowly changing that little bit of a space, yeah. and it's a little bit brighter as, as that attention is given to it. And I think that's the key thing, giving it attention. Yeah, yeah. It's um, your relationship can really change the more you relate. And it is almost, you know, these kind of little pockets of it, it that they're like personalities of the forest. And, um, you know, whether you might see them as maybe, I mean, we don't know, maybe certain beings attending those particular trees, those particular areas. Um, you know, you think about the history of what happened there. I mean, maybe something, I don't know how close to the motorway it is. Maybe something did come off the motorway at some point. You don't know. Or, you know, before the motorway, what was there? And was, do you think that's an old track? 
I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it could well be. I've, I've not researched that. I tend to not research too much because I'm looking things up. And if yeah. I get through it, I can research it. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I more think with a motorway, it's li it's literally a hollow. Just, just you know, you're talking feet from a motorway. I yeah. can just roll off it. And maybe we can think of motorways like a river. Mm. And then you know, it's what it's currents, it's tides, things move on it. Yeah. And um, with that, you know, things get caught in that little hollow, but certainly it's cleared up a lot now. Um, mm. It's very muddy sort of this time of year, but, you know, going out there more and more as the, as the season improves. And, um, you know, keeping track, keeping, being very aware of how it feels, which is the key thing, really. It's all I have, you know. Yeah. No, it's great. I think that's, you know, this time of year, being able to step back into those spaces again and... Um, you know, this, it's, that those spaces themselves seem to greet you, I feel, if you've been away for some time and you have that relationship and then you, you know, reconnect with, with, uh, with them again, it does feel like a, a welcoming and, yeah, it feels good. Um, just sort of starting to get back out into our garden here and uh, being so busy over the winter and it was quite cold and various things going on it just feels really nice to be able to get back out there again and um and have that relationship yeah it's really important. Yeah. I mean, as i said i'm moving soon and it's like you know one of the recent things i've done is i've taken three coins buried them in the crossroads taking a bit of earth with me so when i do move it does come with me yeah and there's a whole lot of magic associated with that of how you just connect to a place and keep that connection pleasant even if you're you know a hundred miles away from it yeah what's the significance with the three queens then how is that to hold the the space in some way it, it's a gift and with your odd numbers are always nice so it's a gift it comes a little bit from voodoo and voodoo those traditions of taking the coins and part of it is working with a book from a, a writer Aidan watcher who's done some very good stuff on 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 actually connecting to a place and making offerings and doing taking crossroads dirt but to Three coins is like almost like traditional, so it's the way to do it, if you like. Mm. Um, and though with that, it's the gift of a place. It's the effort of getting the coins. And you know, I research silver coins on the internet and try to make it as realistic as possible. It's not a sort of gift you'd give where, oh, these three pennies, which mean nothing nowadays, you can do. It's taking the effort and the time to do something meaningful and then give that to the site, take a bit of dirt. And so the, the actual site with meditation and feeling for permission you bring the site with you yeah so that, that's that's all, all there it, 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 it becomes an entanglement that it, it's a welcome entanglement yeah could you even leave something of yourself there or would that not be a good idea if you left oh, you could do um i think myself i mean you know it's again we're talking about social entities yeah um You've got a very strong connection with yourself if you live in, say, I don't know, blood or hair or whatever. Mm. Um, I, I probably wouldn't do that myself um, because, yeah, it, it's a stronger connection. Mm. Somebody's got that, it's got you, it can hold you. You know, mm. it's mm. not necessarily a safe thing. Now, again, everything is circumstance dependent. And if there's an entity you want to work with and you want to make that commitment, that's fine. But yeah. like, you don't leave it at a site where you don't know who's passing through. Mm. So I'd be a bit more coy about that. Mm. Um, I guess you know, that's more for maybe if you have your own home and protection that you absolutely. want to sort of place and, uh, your own energy can, around it. Exactly. You know, some things can be vampiric, um, not in the you know, east, you know, in the sort of Dracula sense, but in the sense that they will drain, they'll pull things from you. So be very careful when you make that commitment. Not to say never do it, but know what you're doing if you're going to do it. You know, yeah. it can be dangerous. So you've had some um, interesting experiences as well. So we, you know, we talked a lot about fairies and maybe we can talk a bit in a moment about, you know, how you think they all sort of relate to, you know, ghosts and ideas of aliens. But you have actually yourself had a fairy experience, which I'm really keen to hear about because I don't think I've spoken to you about this in detail. I know I sort of know about it, but not fully in detail before which um i think i definitely fairy experiences one is a very blatant fairy experience mm. so i'll tell you about one first and then the other one i think is 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 a fairy but again we get into languages like definition what do we mean and all these things yeah yeah 
but the first the fairy experience was um it was about 2002 2003 and i just moved into a flat in St Albans a ground floor flat um the the house did have a river running underneath it I, I found out later and I was a couple of months into moving in and um it was a Saturday afternoon I decided it was time to sort of you know, pull up the old carpet in the bedroom which is a bit down from the corners again suggesting there was some some out there which might be relevant and you know tip, take that to the tip just to get some proper flooring down the next day so no no problem Saturday cleared up the bedroom emptied, emptied the room rolled up all the carpet, went out in the car and got rid of it. Um, now that evening, I did go out for a couple of drinks and literally it's in my diary still. I had two pints of old speckled head. That's all I had. Right? Um, and um, I got back. It wasn't even a late night. I got back about 10 or something. I read a bit and I went to bed. And um, I was woken up about two in the morning by something tapping me on the shoulder. And literally it was a gnome. Pointy red hat, white beard, the works. And I'm, you know, sitting up in bed at this point, thinking, what? You know, this is, this is not possible. Bearing in mind, you know, I, I've always been interested in this sort of thing. You know, I've got the sort of mindset, that I've got no issues with ghosts or whatever. Yeah. You don't expect waking up at two in the morning by a note. It, yeah. it doesn't happen, right? Brilliant. And you know, he was chatting to me in a very, I couldn't understand what he was saying. There were certainly words were being said in a very fast language, yeah? And he was annoyed about something. Now, in retrospect, I assume I pulled up his home and was a bit annoyed. And if I knew then what I know now, I'd have made sort of, you know, some recompense for that and done something, but I didn't know at the time. But, you know, he was sitting there chatting to me. I was sitting up in bed with a, you know, very wide eyes thinking, what? And, you know, oh, I mean, subjectively, I don't know how long the experience took, at least 20 seconds. It was, I was still awake and he faded and I, he never came back. And to this day, I don't know what that was about. And, you know, he's probably on gnome cast somewhere telling a similar story. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I, I'd like again and say, what was all that about? You know, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's unbelievable. It's just, it was there, you know. Yeah. So it's not in meditation. It was, you know, full kind of eyes open. Um, you know, he's just appearing right in front of you. Eyes open. I mean, he woke me up. So certainly I started off being in a sleep state. But he woke me up. But I was sitting up in bed, I was looking in, and after it all happened, I actually got up and you know, did things to do really wake up, you go for a bottle and all those bits and pieces. Yeah. So certainly the end of the experience, there's no break in the experience and then me doing other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, it's like I, I don't know what it was about, you know, it's just he was there. Yeah. What did his face, what did his expression look like? Oh, hard to be hard to recall uh, completely. Um, more from his the way he was gesturing and literally tapping me like that and mm. chatting in a language I didn't understand. It was too fast to understand. Just angry, irritated, very annoyed. Um, as to facial expressions, I, I really can't recall. I don't know. Um, just <laughs> annoyed, you know. Yeah. That mm. is really great. Yeah. Um, the the tone or do you remember the tone of the of his voice or anything like that um again it, it's it was a clattering sound yeah. and it was really high pitched and it, it's very much like it was uh, I, I mean certainly it wasn't in a language it wasn't in english i, I don't no. do languages very well anyway um no. but it was like talking faster than normal a lot faster than normal to the point where it's so fast, you know, when a tape cord and you speed it up and it's like, it gets very high pitched. It was very much like that. Yeah, yeah. But again, in a, yeah, it was just, in a very, it sounded irritable. It sounded very annoyed, yeah? Yeah, um, I can, I can imagine it as you're describing it. I can very much imagine. <laughs> Reminds me of um, also, I don't know if you were ever into the faraway tree. Um, no, I don't know that. Okay, so it's Enid, Enid Blyton. Um, mm. And there was the angry pixie uh, that uh, kept getting annoyed by various shenanigans that were going on in the in the faraway tree in the enchanted wood, and he would always come out and sort of start shouting at people. Yeah, this is before I tempered it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, after um, after that happened, then how long did you stay in the house afterwards? 
Um, well, that was right at the beginning, you know, I was there for about five, six years. Oh, really? There was no other connection with anything then no. which could relate to this. Um, now, at the time, I was doing quite a lot of ghost hunting and so on. And so there was your paranormal experience. I'd always had, you know, sleep paralysis with, you know, the entity, hallucination, incursions, whatever they actually are. All those things were happening anyway, but they were happening before. So I don't want to link it to that. Yeah. Um, the only other thing is I got together with what's well, now an ex at the time, um, just a, a few months after that. And she, 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 she was a very natural exorcist. She could repel things just by her presence, yeah. And um, there was, you know, one evening where she spent the night in hospital, so I was, I was alone in the flat again for the first time in a few months. And something sparked the cat off, and that's, you know, maybe it's nothing. But, you know, the cat who normally sat on the bed, she just panicked for no reason, as cats do sometimes anyway, and was hiding behind the TV. Now, that's not really a characteristic response for her, so mm. maybe something was stirred up again. I don't know. It was... There's nothing I can really say was connected to that experience. No. I don't think I knew enough about clearing attachments and stuff at the time to know what was what and what was picking up to actually tie it to this experience or not. And what did you do with the floor in the bedroom afterwards? So you oh, took oh, up the carpet. The old carpet and underlay went to the tip. That was on the Saturday night, Saturday yeah. before the experience. Yeah. And yeah, it was just um, you know, home-based laminate, I think it was, I put down at the time. Okay. You know, well, he must have just been, you know, gave that his blessing somehow. <laughs> and he was he was fine with that. I don't know what happened. I, again, I would like to make amends. I don't have any connection to do that. It's too late now. Yeah. Was it an old house? Um, probably 1920s, 1930s. Okay. You know, the address is somewhere written down. I can probably find out and dig that, dig that information up. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And then, so the other um, experience you had, that there's, yeah, anyway, you tell the story because it's... Yeah, I mean, that one happened again a lot, a lot earlier. I was about nine. Now, I've got to be careful here not to reveal the location. Um, but my, my parents moved to a house in Lincolnshire, which has got a lot of history. It's about 400 years old, um, back in 1979. So I was eight or nine. And um, for the first six months there, I was always seeing what looked like members of the family. Now, at the time, it was my mum, my dad, um, my older brother, myself, my younger sister, and my younger brother um, living there. So it was a fairly big family. And um, always seeing somebody moving out of the corner of my eye from one room to another, even though I knew that person was at work or definitely out of a house or someone else and so on. It happened for about six months. Really, really, it was a very strong, vivid experience every single time. You're seeing somebody as they walk past you. You know, and um, I didn't know what it was. And again, it's like it was it was that person. It wasn't something taking its form. It was that person. Uh, that's what it looked like, at least. And, you know, it sort of died down after like, you know, six months, seven months, whatever it was. You know, I wasn't keeping diaries when I was nine or ten, however old I was. Um, and it, it died back a lot. There was other experiences in the house, too. Um, the, again, it's things where you sort of, you know, when you're, you go to bed at night and it's like, you know, you're aware of everybody else has gone to bed, even if you've not seen that, you, you hear your parents go up, all those sort yeah. of things. But then you start hearing sounds like chairs scraping on the, on the downstairs floor, all those little things. So there was something going on in the house. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it was still. You know, my mum has left me strict instructions, do not stir that up. And I respect that for obvious reasons. Um, and it, it died off a little bit after like the first couple of months. And then... It's um, just a few odd experiences just over the years. Now, the, the two most prominent ones, so three most prominent ones actually, is about three years later, it's, um, so I was about 12, um, I was at home with my younger brother and he was born in that house, so we'd, we'd come along after we moved in. Mm. And we we're just playing, whatever we were doing. And um, I saw my niece who was, um, at the time, living with us, um, standing next to me. Now, my niece was actually, you know, actually on a shopping trip in Boston, 20 miles away um, at the time. So it wasn't her, but something was taking her form. Yeah. And then my brother said to me, do you need to see Jenny standing there? So whatever happened, we both had the same hallucination at the same time. 
And that one, you know, it, it's, you know, I, I didn't cue him, I saw her. And then he said to me, did you see her? Yeah. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. We described then, but once that, 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 that ice is broken, we described mm -hmm. it, she's wearing my little yellow dress she had when she was uh, four, whatever she was, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's, again, it's one of those moments where it, you become invincible because it's like, there's no way I hallucinated that if somebody yeah. else is saying the same thing. So yeah, it's yeah. that doorway into a bigger world. Yeah, you know, physics mm. can't explain that. That's interesting. Mm. Um, so is it, kind of, is it kind of like the shape of them or their, are they, can you, how clear are they? Can you see their face? Can you see their features? I mean, it was a flash. So you really got like, you know, yeah. like a second. But it was, it was her. It was, I, I, I can't tell you the expression. No. You didn't get the time to get that sort of level of detail. But mm. she was standing there and we described mm. the clothes. We described her just looking there. And all I can think of is we're both children, we're both playing. Maybe something there was attracted to us playing and wanted to take part, you know. So yeah. it was just being really good, yeah. And then, you know, you sort of go through that, and that was that was all, all happening. And then, you know, years later, um, again, it's not diaries, so I can only guess at the year, but I would have been about 18. And it was one of the summers out, out of university. So I was just, you know, I again I've always had sleep catalepsy, I've always had sleep paralysis. Sometimes I experience or hallucinate entities around me um, yeah yeah we can talk about all that a lot of that is understood by psychology there's there's buckets of stuff to talk about on that um but you know i was like you know home that summer and i woke up i was in my catalytic paralyzed state what i would describe as a shadow person walked into the room and it held its hand over my forehead like that not particularly threatening um gesture yeah but it is when you wake up paralyzed though so you know that, that was a Probably the most tangible yeah. all that type experience, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, even at 18, you, you, you scream. Um, and then something my dad told me um, a few weeks after that is my mum had an experience about the same time. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's my parents always kept the landing lights on because some, you know, some of my brothers and sisters were, were younger, so they could always see a bit of light at night and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And um, my dad was asleep, mum had the bedroom, her bedroom door open, and she was awake at night reading, and she saw something move across the, walk through the landing. And she, she thought it was one of us at first, because yeah. you would, yeah. Uh, but when she described it as having literally a just completely blank expressionless face, um, sorry, not expressionless, a blank face, it was all smooth. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she was trying to wake up dad, and dad wasn't waking up, and uh, the only thing she has to say on that is, that um, she, the, the impression she got, which was not supposed to have seen it. Okay. So I think, and this is yeah. pure talk on my part, what she saw was what maybe we were seeing in the house yeah. earlier on, but she saw it in its natural form, not in its taking somebody else's form. form. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. You know, it's it's a very old house. It's very creepy. It's um, if I ever get a chance to investigate it, it'll be after we've all moved away and left it alone for a bit, so I'll probably stir it up and make it worse. Are they um, still there? My mum is still there. My dad passed away in yeah. 2005, but my mum and my younger brother are still living there. And right. you know, literally, it's a house in the middle of a field in Lincolnshire. It's, I'm not going to say more than that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a strange place, and the, the location has got history. Um, it definitely sounds like that that kind of place um, sparked your, you know, your interest in, in doing ghost hunts. Quite you possibly. Say? Uh, maybe. I mean, uh, my interest, it certainly started in that house when I was in Ed Nine. Before that, I don't really recall much more no earlier than that. Um, and again, it, it's possibly layered. So I think certainly what I've just described, I would call something more into a fairy. Um, again, language very, very yeah. dodgy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I've, sorry, I was going to say, I've heard of fetches. Have you have you heard of something called a fetch? I'm trying to think. There was some folklore of fairies which um, take forms as well. That's um, right. Yeah, that take. Effect. I can't recall of hand. Yeah. But there's stuff there where it becomes again. It, you know, house fairies are you know like brownies, for example, unknown. And this one didn't really tidying up. I can go and see that. You know, it's no. it was just there. But 
again, I think it's location. Um, yeah. The whole place is spooky anyway. I mean, and some stuff you read into it. You know, if you sort of drive down, there's like a half mile long drive down from the road to the house. And there's a willow tree in the field to the next. And it looks, you know, when you're nine, you notice these things. It looks like an old man sitting down watching the house, yeah? You don't need that when you're growing up, really, you know? Um, well, no, it. I suppose not. That is terrifying. But yes, yeah, so it's, it's, got, it's got a pokey character to it. It's just like bats in the attic. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's a strange place. It's, you know, it's... Um, it's a house which you know does does need researching, but you know now is not the time. I'm not going to stir up my mum's house. That's not, not going to happen. No, you know? <laughs> she's warned you off it. It'll be. That's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> does she know what you that you know the sorts of things that you're you're doing with your ghost she, hunts? She knows like the that. stuff. She knows pretty much everything. Um, yeah. I know again less. It's sort of le less connected. You know, it's like she's called me fairly recently. My dad had similar seeing. Um, people seeing forms which are like family members moving to the house, which he never told me at the time. And he right. said, well, I'll tell you all this stuff there before he passed. And then, of course, we never got to hear his stories firsthand. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I wasn't the only person to pick things up in the house. Um, but it probably did start me off a little bit and got me interested. And, you know, from there, moved to London, joined the Ghost Club, went on investigations, and just got more and more involved from there, really. Oh, great. Yeah, you seem to have a really nice, close ties to London so I, yeah I hadn't realized that you'd lived there for quite uh, quite so long so you're you're planning to move back there aren't you do you think you're gonna sort of start running some interesting I certainly hope so um yeah. I run a group well I'm, I'm starting a group that's still very new the secret lines of London which looks into all that it's a brilliant um, group on I Facebook it's on Facebook it's on Twitter yeah. And it's um, it's a reference for secret lines, as reference to the goddess Ellen in other ways, oh, who very yes. much the ley lines and paths moving out. And Ellen is a goddess of London, and she's linked to Old King Cole. And there's again lots of folklore we can dig into on that. Um, a guy who trying to get dates now, early 20th century, I think. Harold Bailey wrote some books on folklore, which looks into all of it. And he didn't put any of the sources down, unfortunately. So we don't quite know where he got this information from, but he talks about all these things and how it gets to London and London reaches up to everywhere. So we can draw a line, say, from London to Stonehenge. We can draw a line, say, from, from London to, you know, haunted woods in Somerset, you know, down the road to me and so on, um, or, or to Bristol and all these places. And each of these are important points where folklore congregates. And so, yes, I want to be, I want to, well, two things I want to do is A, get a group together of actually do a bit of psychic development, a bit of psychic protection, and know how to investigate these things from a paranormal psychic approach without equipment, keep that as low key as possible. I very much think that when you're investigating, you don't want technology. You're using the left side of the brain, you're busy looking at readouts, looking at things like that, you're not busy feeling. Yeah. Well, so I'm very, let's keep it as low key as possible. Yeah. And Know, know how to protect a little bit, know how not to pick up attachments, because I can tell you how to pick up attachments, I can tell you how to get rid of attachments now. Um, but then also look at things from the metaphorical perspective and see where we're going with all these things, because, you know, it's it's more interesting. I'd rather have an experience than a readout what said, you know, the EMF peaked at this point, suggesting something. So yeah. it's taking that and trying to do something a little bit different and, you know, Keep it with people who would just want to keep low key about this stuff. I don't want media, I don't want too much of that. I just want to keep it, you know, interested people wanting to run a bit and see where it goes. Yeah, I think, you know, I'd, I've never I've never done any anything like that, but I'm really fascinated and um, and I'd love to come along for sure. Um, I think sort of, like you say, remaining open seems the most sensible thing to do. I guess that's just kind of our that's just what we like to do so there are other people but um you know their bag is to come with the equipment and um you know start to sort of find ways to rationalize it in a way you know through temperatures through you know spirit boxes and all these sorts of things and that's that's what really gets them going and that's great as well um but yeah i think for me it's it's um just being open and sensing and then being able to exchange afterwards what you felt, experienced in some way, noticed, or 
Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You know, there are space folk approaches, and maybe we can learn from each other in the future. But you know, certainly, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm having a lot more fun doing it this way, and that's really where, where, I, where I go with that because it's um, it, it does give you the experience. And I think the, the key for me is actually to encounter things. And things are happening, and sometimes again, it's no what what level those things are happening. So on one level, you know. Mm-hmm. The, the, the pipes are banging, for example, when you're asking questions. And okay, it's a plumbing thing. A physicist or a plumber will say pressure's dropping here. It's a means, though. It's but a it's means. Happened, and it's happening at the right time. Yeah. So you get meaningful information from it. So yeah. when you get yes, no answers, which then you can later check out and validate, it means that um, actually something's happening. And yes, pressure's dropping in the plumbing somewhere. Yes, I know that. But it's happening at the right time to actually give me an answer. And that's yeah. really interesting. It's paying it, attention, isn't it? It's paying attention. And it says a lot about our world and how these things work, because we just don't know yeah. still, you know, how they're, how these things are all entangled into things, you know, and it, it's, um, I've, my, my, my thoughts on this are very much that somehow we, the supernatural world, or whatever language you want to use, has a way to create order out of randomness. And so that's how you shuffle a tarot deck and you get a meaningful answer, or pipes are banging, or whatever, whatever. It's doing it because it can collapse at randomness at the right time. It's a mechanism. So, you know, the research, I think, needs to go into things like this to see why is it doing it? How is it doing it? I don't know, but it does it. I'm I'm convinced of that. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. I was thinking also about um, how all of these experiences, so with the kind of the the fairy sorts of experiences and the ghost experiences, and even the experiences in the forest and connecting with those locations, um, you know, how they tie in with sort of alien and UFO experiences as well, because some people might enter a forest and you know, sense something to do with um, alien or UFO presence there, and you know, um, yeah. What What's your take on? Because you've had some UFO experiences as well, haven't you? Not me. Um, my, oh. my, so I'm quite closely allied to people who have, but um, yeah, I haven't. Okay. Been um, but yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting. I think it's related. Um, and when we get to UFOs, I think there's a whole tangle of things to unpick. So some of it is probably, you know, government black ops, exotic aircraft being tested secretly and whatever, right? And, mm. you know, and some of it is maybe real visitors from other worlds coming here. You know, they're, they're playing Star Trek in reverse and coming to see us. Yeah. Um, but then some of it maybe is the, what we call fairies or entities um, I mean, maybe fairies come from space, we don't know, right? You know, we, we associate with woodland. Um, and I think what we have in our heads is we, we put things through a filter. So some of us who are maybe more magic oriented might see things in that traditional fairy, medieval fairy tale, fairies type thing. Other people from a more sort of technical background might see things from a more sort of space traveller background. I don't know. It's, I think a lot of it is overlapping because a lot of the experiences are the same you get time loss you get all the foods to booze which people are saying yeah. talks about yeah you've got the going into the hill going into the mound going into the saucer type thing um all, all these commonalities are all there and you get the weirdness with UFOs as well um i'm trying to think of a guy's name now um there's the the, the account i love the most is this guy in wisconsin was camping and aliens turn up they offer to trade him um, pancakes for water. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, Joe Simulton, that's his name, yeah. And it's like they have a pancake. There's, there's like, I think, three pancakes, which were described as quite cardboardy and not very nice. That is a mad one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? Yeah. And it's like, you know, there's no reason to call him a liar. You know, I mean, if you're going to make something up, why make a story like that? He wouldn't do it, yeah. Um, you know, there's no reason to assume he's ill or has got you know, mental health issues to make something about up either. So, you know, I buy the experience. Um, many of us in these fields have had their share of weird experiences, mm. but I'm not going to say somebody else is a liar just because their weird experience is weird of a mind. We, we still have weird experiences. So. That's so true, isn't it? Because even when we're speaking to people ourselves, and we've both had some really, you know, unusual and fascinating experiences that 
a lot of people would find hard to to swallow really which is fair enough um, and then we think we're very open but then when you know occasionally you you do hear other stories and you think well I'm, I'm really not sure about that and and for, you know some will be obviously for good reason but a lot of them might simply be that that's just we've reached our threshold in what we feel is yeah. is possible and you know believable um you know I wonder how how they get on in the world it's hard enough for just anybody that's that's maybe seen a fairy or or seen a UFO um which is I mean UFOs of course you know they're a bit more mainstream seeing a fairy hopefully is becoming known to be um you know not as as rare as some people think um, because there are plenty of accounts now but common as ghosts i would say we're getting close to that you know? yeah it's our culture is fairly materialistic for the most part mm. so ufos as space travelers is maybe more acceptable to consciousness than fairies maybe that's why we're seeing ufos are coming more becoming more popular nowadays or they have been and there's a lot of stuff going on there but again it's not to unpick it with what also is going on with you know, black ops and military stuff yeah. and, and so we don't know about we can speculate about. this is the thing although i have noticed um and i'm sure that we well i know that we've spoken about this on on uh, patreon with the crew as well but just so much more activity happening i mean i really noticed it um i was noticing it from sort of about october last year lots of things going on in the home and um have you been noticing that too i think so yeah i've been noticing it really for a couple of years now since all the lockdowns and covid have been happening mm. i mean my you know, best guess is we're living in a less enriched environment so our, our brains are are reaching out trying to try to find more things to do so whether it's us hallucinating things which i don't think is the case or whether actually we're picking up on more things because it's around us, we can't go out so much, and we couldn't go out so much when lockdowns were in full force. So we're becoming very aware of what's around us. And I, 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 do, I do think that's been happening. You know, there's been certainly peaks in, in dreaming, for example, as well. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, definitely. My, my, I mean, when I moved into this house, it was very flat and not active at all. It's a lot more active now. I'm moving out soon, you know. Yeah. I, I, I moved. Um, yeah, I, I do think it's the case that people are more picking up those, but also maybe consciously as well. I mean, with with things like COVID, we've seen, you know, examples that say people talking to the neighbours and saying, if you can't get your food, I'll go to the supermarket and get your food mm. for you. I'll, I'll do your shopping and so on. Thank so there's quite more yeah. community, there's much more kindness out there. Yeah. And maybe that's also given us that back connectivity, which entangles us in the world a little bit. I mean, I don't know, but I would speculate on those lines, definitely. See, this is the point that I was thinking about is that um, because we were not able to physically visit each other, and of course we were using, you know, we're using uh, Zoom and phoning people and things like that, but we, we're really connecting at a heart level, actually, and, 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 you know, through spirit as well. So, you are experience, you're experiencing your relationships with people at another level aside from the physical. And we've got a little bit more used to doing that. I think one example I keep keeps coming to me um, at the moment is the way, um, so for myself, I've started working back in the office now. So, um, and, you know, people have come and gone in that time I've just started a new job so um but basically when you when you're going in there um you're not sure whether you've met them in person before or on zoom but you feel like you already feel like you've you've met and you've got to know them now I I think that um that is an indication of us being able to sense each other's consciousness I mean people have different ideas about consciousness I feel you know some people would say your aura goes for two meters and and that's kind of the end of it I err on the side of thinking that your consciousness your your energy consciousness actually is infinite and that it intermingles with everybody around the planet so like you say there's been much more connection and and that really 
that really does lift you know the vibration if you like of of our planet but also this sense that this interconnect interconnectedness that um we may not be physically meeting one another but we sense each other and we really kind of get to know each other um you know people have made really strong friendships through this time on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as well in that same way they may not have even seen each other's faces it may literally be through writing to one another but you really you really do get a sense of them I, I, perhaps that's just my own thing that I you know my own tangent but uh, what do you think about that? I think we're a lot more connected than we think and yeah. I do you know all this go beyond two meters again there's a mechanism maybe which that, that describes and we can get into like an Eastern jargon of each little bit. But then we're reaching out more and more. And other things we have, uh, we enforce that. So, for example, Facebook. I, I love Facebook. Um, yeah. I'm a home worker. I've been a home worker for, you know, about five years now. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's my lifeline at work. You know, I, I, I set some software up, what it's doing, and then I sit and have a quick look to what's going on. And so I'm, I'm connected to people, you know, all the time in that sense. And I think it does change us um, when we look at things and our responses to things. So, for example, the war in Ukraine, um, what's happened? There was a lot of outpourings, a lot of cross. There's, there's lots of issues about it. I'm not going to go into the politics of it. No. But it's things like, say, people, photographs of people bringing their pets out of Ukraine. That, that's been unknown. We've never seen pictures of that from other war zones. Mm. So there's that actual humanity maybe is become a bit more aware, a bit more conscious a bit more caring in other dimensions, like our pets, our thing, the things around us, which we haven't seen before. And I think all that is the expression of, of the connectedness, yeah. whether it's through Facebook or through a, a psychic tingling as to, this person is really nice, I don't know them yet, but yes, I'm going to be friends. You just know, yeah. Whatever, yeah. You know, yeah. the outpouring is not the sharing of memes and the expression of grief and horror, but it, it's the connectedness and it's for the caring for the people, the caring for the pets, and things which actually define us as living beings, of caring beings, which is far more important maybe than worrying about politics, which, you know, is, is its own thing, that's something different. Yeah, I think that that's so true. There's that level, and, you know, and some people just don't want to look at that, and that's fine, I think. Um, but what you can actually see instead, you know, is, is okay, there's a lot of really awful things going on in the world and that have have been going on and a lot of suffering before this time you know in other places in the world of course this is the west now that are sort of um you know um, perhaps experiencing this, this these kind of sufferings you know thinking more of covid actually um in these times but what you have seen um more and more in these times I mean, and leading up to this time in the decades leading up to it is that although really awful things are happening in the world that never before have you seen so many people wanting to help you know you have even with humanitarian uh, disasters uh, with people humanitarian groups going out to disasters um, in the decades leading up to this just giving their lives because they want to help and you see people here in the situations that we've been in um, in the last few years where people are saying I, I, I can't just not do anything I need to do something physical to help um, sometimes with little regard for their own safety as well. Yeah totally I mean yeah. you know, I saw today on Facebook one Facebook friend who lives in Italy is driving up to a Polish border to actually yes. just people back you know and yeah. it's, you know, I'm sure this has happened all the time um, now maybe we're just more aware of it. Maybe. Uh, maybe I think we're also feeling it more. It's like, you know, there's more, you know, I, I'm a carnivore, but there's more of a move say, to vegetarianism, to veganism, yeah. to be aware of the issues. So even if you have a burger, you're aware of what the burger is, all yeah. those things. Yeah? And, you know, yeah. humanity is, I think, slowly becoming that, that much more sensitive. Yeah. And then, then that's when we make a choice what do we want to become. And that's a big question for humanity which, you know, is, is, is a big question, I think, yeah. Let's, let's hope we all choose just kindness so we can really do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. And maybe everything that we're looking into is part and parcel of that. Maybe this is a coming together and the community stretches out to these other realms and that we are experiencing a period 
or um, you know, uh, crossing a threshold to increase connectivity with those realms, and that that I feel is a good thing. I think I think it will. Um, and again, it's like if you say, look at um, oh, the name's gone. Um, give me a second. The famous book of fairies, the guy who died on the hill in Scotland. Um, Rev, uh, Kirk. Look, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like he just described very much fairy communities under the earth and civilization, all those things there. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's, there's similar accounts. So you find, say, in in Middle East, accounts of jinn, very similar, for example. Yeah. Um, but maybe it's not quite like that. And maybe again, how we look after our countryside, our farmlands, our cities, even. And I think you find fairies in cities as much as you find them in the countryside. It's we don't quite know how they live yet. How they involve themselves in their environment like you know we know that we we have to go to work we live in houses and we go to a supermarket to get food all things we do i don't necessarily live like that and so as we change our world we're changing their world for them too mm. and maybe that's why there's maybe maybe why it's it, it's actually with the change of humanity becoming a bit more sensitive maybe that's why there's more encounters coming up because we're actually meshing better with with these other inhabitants of our world mm. yeah just like i suppose yeah it, we as we are i was thinking about your carpet again and the and the the fairy you know whatever you did um sort of moving in there had an effect on him <laughs> and i just exactly. you know those can be good good and and bad uh effects mm -hmm. and uh but the point is that we're we're open to communicate, I think. And this house was living in probably in some slightly damp corner of the room. So we can't describe it as a house as we would understand it. And not living in, in the world as we understand it, perhaps, yeah. Um, but certainly as a presence, and I, I do think I stirred up his home, whatever it was, mm -hmm. yeah. But we can't conceptualize how that gnome lived. It's just not we don't have that. So it's different worlds there we don't quite we can't mesh them together yet to understand i think the more we think about that the more we find, might find new ways to learn about them more tools to actually in, not so much investigate them that becomes a bit too mm. uh, colonial um to yeah. communicate with them and then to, to actually start building relationships again um yes. you know we sometimes need to st step back and maybe think in the past we knew a lot more you know, where did all the, all the rules come from to, to talk to the Fae? All the things you're not supposed to, like fan cam and all these bits and pieces. Quite right. Better communication they had. Yeah. We, yeah. And, you know, it's like if I put milk out to, you know, to, to a brownie or whatever, it's like, why? Why is milk popular, for example? All these little bits and pieces. Um, and, it, you know, there's accounts as well, but it works the other way. There's all the stories, the stories in Somerset, for example, of farmers 100 to 200 years ago who never had the time to get all their, all their grain thrashed away. Mm. Farmers so they, they, it gets up in the night, it goes into the barn, and the fairies are actually sorting out all the form for them. Yeah? Um, we, we don't have experiences of that, of that, of that level of, of drama nowadays, or that level of intensity. Yeah? The best we have are pancakes. Pancakes are cool, but it's, you know, it was much more visceral in the past, much more physical and strong um but then maybe the world has moved away but maybe now we're turning the corner moving back towards them right. again yeah, yeah. Um, we did definitely take you know take a different path didn't we so yeah i do hope that we are leading back to ourselves again it feels like we kind of lost ourselves you must have come across accounts the, the sorry, sorry. No, you, must, you must have come across accounts of the fey leaving the fairies leaving and their stories of fairies, troops of fairies, we're going for this world now. Yep. And, yeah. those and again, it seems maybe it's going the other way now, and they're actually starting to come back. Because, you know, the, the encounters are stronger than ever, and the human interest is stronger than ever. With Marjorie Johnson's book, with, um, you know, being republished, with, um, you know, with, with your group, all the things which are happening are actually bringing them back into focus again. And it's like, if you go back, say, 30 years, it's like, oh, I saw a fairy. That's almost embarrassing. Now, actually, it's acceptable. It's just fine. It's just what happens. It's part of the experiences we have. And it's not cloaked in UFOs. It's not cloaked in these are my grandparents' stories. These are cloaked in this is my experience. Yeah. And that's what makes it, I think, very valuable. Yeah, I mean, Marjorie Johnson was so in inspiring. And, um, yeah, I think, I, I guess that that is sort of the 
the line I'm hoping to take with uh, the Modern Fairy Sightings project is just to, as she did, just collect these stories and, you know, allow people a space to, to talk about them and then um, allow other people to hear them and, or in her case, read them. Those, those accounts are so precious and, uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's interesting, as you say, I think it's not about sort of the investigating and needing to get answers and all of those, you know, it's just about let's kind of see, see what this leads to. Let's see what we can learn from this. It's, um, it's, the world, you know, it's, yeah. it's not, you know, if we want to investigate it, there's that dominance to it. We don't need to do that. Yeah. We just need to explore it and see what happens, you know. Um, you know, and Simon Young um, yeah. got more of from Marjorie's book. And um, you know, again, another person who's doing so much fantastic work and let's look at the experiences. And how awesome. I mean, we live in a film a world where fairies exist. I mean, it's preposterous, but it's brilliant at the same time, you know. It's true. Oh, thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, let us know um, what you're doing in London when you get there and settled. Oh, I will. And yeah, I mean, when people contact me, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, you know, I'm fairly approachable. Um, so yeah, you know, there'll be projects happening, getting busier as I sort of you know, get past the move and get sorted. Yeah. And it'll be fairy, ghost, UFO related. And there's, there's stuff I want to do. So yeah. Stay tuned, and know. it's um, Secret Lines of London. Secret Lines of London. Um, you've got, I think you've got the links. If not, I'll send them the show notes and so yeah, on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put the links up. And th so that's, that's the best way to contact you through Facebook. But Facebook's the best. I mean, I'm on Twitter as well, but Facebook is where I am most of the time when my boss is not looking so yeah yeah brilliant okay yeah <laughs> okay thank you very much and no, see you, you soon great discussion to see you soon. Right. Cool. bye bye